the issue of Brexit is a hugely important one for the UK. It's been a momentous decision uh, that was taken in the referendum and uh, how it's implemented will have repercussions for our economy and for our society for many years to come, for many decades to come. What I've tried to set out in, in, in this talk uh, is essentially what the impact would be of Brexit. And uh, as an economist, you have to look at the various channels by which Brexit can negatively impact on the UK economy. Um, and the impact could be very, very significant indeed. Uh, you can model these things using macroeconomic models. And um, if we look at Scotland, for instance, uh, we've done, uh, uh, as part of this exercise, together with uh, the Scottish government, a, a number, looked at a number of scenarios. And one particular scenario is one in which there is a very soft Brexit, i.e. the UK stays within the European economic area. And that leads between now and 2030 to a loss of around 2.5% of, of GDP relative to what it would, we would be like if we stayed in the EU. But that gets worse if we end up in a hard Brexit situation where all we have is a free trade agreement with the EU. So if we had a, a Canada-style free trade agreement, for instance, by 2030, our economy would be 6.1% smaller than it would have been if we'd stayed in the EU. And if we crash out of um, the talks that we're currently having with the European Union with no deal and we traded under what are called WTO conditions, then we could end up with 8.5% uh, lower GDP than if we'd stayed in the EU. So these are significant numbers, and, and, and these are not just numbers that come out of Scottish government or from advisors uh, uh, to Scottish government, but uh, they're actually echoed in the sort of studies which have been done around the UK by various independent think tanks. And indeed, they also reflect what uh, the UK government itself thinks, because we know from a leaked document which was published by BuzzFeed um, that actually these are very similar numbers to what the impact on the UK economy as a whole might be um, if we do end up with a hard Brexit or actually crashing out without a deal. So what happens is, is really significant. But of course, the trade losses uh, from Brexit are not the only thing we need to worry about. There are other impacts uh, which matter to the economy. Uh, for instance, the, for Scotland, a, a big issue is what it does to stabilize our demography. One, one huge advantage of free movement within uh, the EU has been that Scotland has been able to attract very talented um, people to, 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 to our country. We've had about 181,000 um, coming to Scotland, working here, studying here, um, and adding to our economy. In fact, if it hadn't been for this free movement uh, into Scotland, then actually, uh, probably we would have had a shrinking population over the last few years, which would have impacted negatively not only in our society through uh, the skills that these uh, talented uh, EU migrants uh, have brought, whether to the NHS or to vital industries, but actually it would have affected our, our, our tax base as well and, and, and would have made us worse off. So these are the sort of negative impacts one has to consider when one, one looks at Brexit. Um, a key issue is, of course, where we go from here. And, and one of the things I, I, I discussed in my talk is where we are in the negotiations at the moment. Of course, we, we've gone through phase one of the negotiation. There seems to be a draft withdrawal uh, agreement on the table. Some of those details still have to be agreed. And we're now getting into the, the, the discussions around the legal text, around what might be a transition period, but also, very importantly, what the future framework of the relationship will be between the EU and the UK. And this is where it gets very complicated because the two sides uh, in the negotiation, the EU and the UK, are looking at very different models. At, at the moment, the EU sees the fact that the UK rejects freedom of movement and rejects any kind of jurisdiction by the Court of Justice of the EU as two important red lines, which means we can't really get much more than a Canada-style free trade agreement. And uh, that, as I said earlier, would be pretty damaging. The UK thinks we can do more than that, we can be more ambitious, and we should be aiming for something which is much more of a partial integration into the European single market. Now, the difficulty here is that there are not that many models of partial integration of the, into the European single market. There's basically two main uh, models around. One is the arrangements that the EU has with Switzerland, which is based on a whole set of bilateral deals. And the other is the arrangements that uh, they have with Ukraine and with the Eastern neighborhood countries. 
The problem for the EU is that they don't want to reproduce another uh, such agreement for two reasons. First of all, the Swiss agreement has been very difficult to manage. It's led to many tensions, and the EU would prefer actually Switzerland to move to what is currently the arrangement for countries like Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland, which is to be an integrated, integral part of the European economic area of the European single market. For um, for the Ukrainian deal, it's a very different kind of deal because this was offered at a time when we're, the EU is trying to encourage those countries like the Ukraine to get closer to the EU into more of a regulatory alignment. So from the EU's perspective, it's difficult how they might want to offer that to a country like the UK, which is potentially aiming to diverge in regulatory terms, at least for some sectors from, from the EU. So that's the nub of the issue and whether there is any space there for negotiation. The UK would like to achieve that and would like to find some sort of hybrid model that would allow it to continue to trade in key sectors for us, manufacturing where we have integrated uh, supply chains with the rest of Europe or financial services which account uh, with all services account for uh, 70 to 80 percent of the UK economy, they account for 40 percent of our export. It's absolutely critical that we can continue to have uh, unfettered access to the European market. So for, from the EU perspective, this is the key uh, element. Uh, for, for the UK perspective, it's, that's the key element of, of, of our negotiation. But there's many other issues which might prevent us from reaching an agreement apart from what the shape of the future framework might be. One of the really key technical issues in the moment is how do we resolve the conflicting aims of the EU, which wants to ensure that the UK adheres to its commitments under the Good Friday uh, agreements to have essentially no border for uh, goods and people, no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. And the UK, which is trying to achieve whatever is the best arrangement, which uh, allows us to exit the single market uh, and indeed not be part of the EU customs union whilst maintaining that, that, that open border. And the UK and EU have very different visions of how that could happen. The UK thinks there may be technological solutions that allow us to achieve that. The EU thinks that the only way to do that is through regulatory alignment between the whole of the UK, if possible, but perhaps uh, Northern Ireland, if that's not possible as a backstop, uh, and the Irish Republic. And that would not be acceptable to, to the UK. So the Irish issue is actually one of the key issues that may actually uh, create real problems for the current negotiation. Where might we end up? Well, there's basically three scenarios here where we might end up. The first one is that there isn't a deal on a withdrawal agreement or indeed, uh, and therefore not even on a transition. I think that's less likely now. I think they will, the two sides are very likely to proceed at least at the transition or implementation phase given where they got to this far, even if they can't resolve uh, the Irish border issue uh, in, in detail, or indeed they can't, they certainly will not have come to a future framework agreement by October. So we may end up in a situation where uh, the, you know, uh, where you end up in, in October by the time that we need to, the, the deal needs to be put to the EU 27 and to the UK in a rather fuzzy situation where not everything's been nailed down yet. We move into the transition phase uh, and some of these issues then become uh, apparent after we've left the EU. So after March 2019, and at that point, uh, there is still a chance of a cliff edge. So that's a pretty negative scenario because uh, we would not be in the EU, we would not be in a very strong position to negotiate at all at that point, and uh, we would have to presumably just take the terms that were offered. The other possibility is that a withdrawal agreement is agreed, a transition phase is agreed, and we find during the transition phase that we can come to some sort of free trade agreement with the EU, perhaps one that's enhanced relative to what is currently an offer to Canada and South Korea, which allows some partial integration into the European single market. And that is, of course, what the UK would like to achieve. But the EU at the moment would find that more difficult uh, to accept, given how it conceives of the European single market. The third possibility is that actually we could end up in a soft Brexit. And that would be achieved probably if we move to a transition phase. We, there is a withdrawal agreement. There is a transition phase agreed. We could end up in a, in a transition where it becomes obvious that there are no solutions to the problem of the Irish border. There are no solutions to a partial integration to the European single market. And the transition then gets extended beyond the end of 2020. 
to say beyond the next UK general election. And at that point, the UK accepts that we need to have a, a very much closer relationship of full integration to the European single market, of full regulatory alignment. But then it involves us accepting many of the other conditions of that, like free movement or, or some variant of, of, of completely free movement. For that to happen, you do need some sort of text in the legal uh, agreement which allows you to extend the transition period because at the moment the EU has made it very clear that it doesn't want it to, uh, the transition agreement to go beyond uh, the end of 2020. So it's very complicated, but there are these three broad scenarios. So the next few months will, will tell us all. I mean, certainly if, if, if past experience is anything to go by, um, it could take a long time for, for these things to be resolved and they could go down to the wire. From, from my perspective, I, I do think the only type of Brexit which, which would impose least damage on the, e, on the UK and indeed in Scotland would be one where we stayed part of the European Economic uh, Association and we stayed part of the Customs Union. That would resolve the issue, of course, of the Irish border, but it would also keep uh, us closely aligned with uh, our biggest uh, trade trading market and indeed many of the other trade deals which the EU has done with the rest of the world, which we benefit from. In the case of Scotland, it would also have this huge benefit, and not only for Scotland, also for, for, for London. It would have, uh, and many other parts of the UK, would have the benefit that we would continue to, to be able to have free movement and therefore the access to that vital talent that actually helps our society uh, and our economy going. So from my point of view, the soft Brexit solution is really the only type of Brexit which, whilst worse than fully EU membership, is one that would uh, have the best benefits for the UK and Scotland. But there's still all to play for and there are still some very difficult moments ahead in the negotiation.